Yeah. See how that works. Cloud never fails. Until it does. Just the fun part of this talk. The cloud never fails. All right, do you want to give it another minute or two to get started? I think go for it. All right, perfect. Well, I appreciate everyone's time and, and thanks for joining. So we'll get, get right into it. So chaos engineering when you're not Netflix. So my name is Martez Reed. I am a principal training solutions engineer at Puppet focused on internal as well as external enablement for our products. We found on LinkedIn, Twitter, GitHub, a lot of the usual places. So what is chaos engineering? And so I started looking into chaos engineering maybe a couple of years ago. Um, I would see it come up every now and then trying to figure out, okay, what is, what is it really for? What does it do? Um, and so the Description or definition I got from one of the links here is uh, principles of chaos engineering um, is chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So that's kind of a, a mouthful. And so after I sort of thought about it and thought about it, distilled it down to essentially another type of testing for validating our assumptions is really what chaos engineering is. And so for those that have done unit testing, uh, acceptance testing, it's essentially another form of testing that we can leverage to validate our assumptions about systems. And so in this case, one of the, the big companies that kind of started uh, the movement of chaos engineering was known to, to have sort of pioneered it is Netflix. And so one of the talks that's actually pretty good is Mastering Chaos. Um, that is still on YouTube, it's actually from a number of years ago, um, but it kind of talks about a lot of the things as far as what Netflix was doing in terms of chaos engineering. And so we kind of step into, well, who's Netflix? And so as an IT industry, and honestly, in a, as a society as a whole, there's a, essentially the, the copycat, um, sort of mechanism or, or thought process. And so somebody does something really interesting that we think is cool, especially in IT, it's like, oh, wow. Um, in the case of like Kubernetes now with, with Google, having essentially created Kubernetes, it's, this is very interesting. Let's, let's everybody wants to try and do Kubernetes now. And so the challenge is, um, at least in my estimation, especially when you start talking about large enterprise companies, is are you really Netflix? or are you XYZ company that sells widgets, as an example? Um, and so it's a case of trying to figure out who are you trying to emulate or imitate? So in the case of Netflix, uh, most of us I'm sure know what Netflix does at its sort of core, which is online streaming uh, for the, the millions and millions of those of us that are now stuck at home um, it's a, a great opportunity to sort of decompress and watch a movie or watch a binge watch a TV show. So the thing is, that's when we start to think about what Netflix's core business is. Their core business is really strongly coupled to technology as opposed to a lot of enterprise organizations where now technology is really just becoming a differentiator as well as an enabler of what they're trying to do as a business not so much always the, the core aspect of their business. In addition to that, Netflix, um, Google this today, has 8,600 plus employees. Um, every organization doesn't have that many employees. And one thing I wasn't able to actually get was a breakdown of the employees that were uh, essentially technology focused roles. But I have a, a pretty good assumption that a, a very large number um, of those employees are focused on core technology functionality, whether it's in a, a pure engineering role or project management 
or architect role, whatever it might be. Um, it, it's focused on some aspect of the technology. And then in addition to that, their revenue for 2019 was $20 billion. And so kind of the case of this scenario is, what was the purpose of talking about sort of who Netflix is? Kind of as I mentioned, things we look to emulate, people we look to emulate, even in life, it's a case of figuring out who that individual is or what that company is and how they're able to do the things they can do. And so everybody is not a Netflix where there's $20 billion in revenue or 8,600 employees. And so it's understanding how the things they do can translate to my organization that may not have 8,600 employees. We may have 600 employees and a couple of million dollars in revenue. And so it's understanding that we may not be able to do everything that a Netflix does or not to the scale that a Netflix does. And so I talked about Netflix sort of pioneering chaos engineering. So one of the things they invented, um, invented, created, however we want to term that, was Chaos Monkey. And so Chaos Monkey was a tool that went through the AWS environment and killed off, randomly killed off EC2 instances. And so the goal of that was as part of the testing of chaos engineering. And so it was, how does the environment respond to a random EC2 instance being killed off? And so they additionally started to expand upon that capability with what they termed as the Simeon Army, um, which included latency monkey, conformity monkey, a number of other monkeys and um, sort of primates, prime apes, uh, as part of the, the family of, or the suite of tools for chaos engineering. And so that was sort of the, the aspect of the chaos engineering. And so found out where Netflix is sort of at today in uh, the construct of their, their purely technology aspect. And so they've got, according to, to Google, a thousand plus microservices, uh, which is actually pretty astounding. And so on the right is the, the Netflix graph uh, from a, a number of years ago, but kind of mapping out their, their microservices. And it's, it's definitely an eye fool. And one of the biggest things is understanding that they're doing it at uh, a pretty large scale. I'd imagine most of us don't have a thousand microservices. Um, maybe we have five, maybe we have 10. Um, and then it's understanding how that translates to, to what we do as an organization and understanding that we're not Netflix. We can take some of the things that Netflix does, some of the practices, some of the best practices, some of the technologies that Netflix does, but we need to translate it to uh, our organization and not just think we can just take what was being done at Netflix and just drop that into our organization. One of the other things I looked at was the number of open source projects that Netflix has created. Um, I include this as a reference to sort of the, the engineering focus as well as just the, the capability that they have as an engineering organization. Um, most organizations of a relatively small size aren't uh, creating and maintaining 20 plus open source projects. Um, there are some that do and they do a great job of it, but understanding that there is a difference between number one, the, the organizational focus of a Netflix and potentially uh, your organization, as well as the, the aspect of, and I think it's one thing we, we don't typically talk about in IT, but it's sort of understood is there's a difference in talent. Um, those that may work at a Netflix are more seasoned, or maybe they're just really good at what they do. And understanding that at your organization, you're gonna have a, a difference in the, the level of engineering capability and understanding that difference and how that plays and factors into some of the technical and non-technical decisions that you end up making. And so we kind of established everybody's not Netflix. And so what do we do when we're not Netflix? So how do we use chaos engineering? And so this is where we start to walk through what chaos engineering actually looks like. Um, it's, it's sort of a loaded term in that it has the, the engineering part. But if I think if we called it like chaos testing, people would be like, oh yeah, it's just another form of testing. And so there's, there's sort of this mystique uh, about chaos engineering. And so one of the first places we actually start is uh, in our architectures 
everybody has assumptions about how the architecture is going to respond. So common assumptions as examples might be if an ESXi host, um, VMware ESXi host fails, the workloads will migrate to another host. That is uh, an assumption that we have if the environment is supposed to respond in that manner. Additionally, if the primary firewall fails, traffic will cut over to the secondary firewall. That's an assumption that we have. These are, are typically things that we consider when we're designing our environments. Uh, what are our single points of failure? We sort of walk through that process uh, of identifying what single points of failure are and trying to address those um, either through mitigation or actually addressing those through some sort of technology or uh, automation process. Another one might be if the instance's CPU is at 95%, um, another one's gonna be added to the pool. And then the last one might be if a service stops, we'll receive a notification. So that one sort of departs from typically what we would think about chaos engineering being of breaking something and then figuring out how the system responds from a pure focus of resiliency. Um, this one touches to more so the, the outlying aspects of what we consider um, resiliency or incident management, or in this case, incident response. So there's an incident, in this case, it's the service being stopped. And what's the response? The response I would expect is a service is stopped. If it's a critical service, I'm going to get some sort of notification about the incident. And so mapping to those assumptions, we have what are known in chaos engineering as experiments. Um, and so it's a, a pretty scientific process in that we're conducting experiments. So mapping to those assumptions, if an ESXi host fails, um, the workload will migrate. And so one experiment might be, and obviously these are, uh, especially these first two, pretty, pretty extreme, but there are definitely scenarios where um, things that could potentially happen in real life that if we don't test for them, sometimes we caught off guard. So one of them would be randomly restarting an ESXi host. And so we anticipate that all the workloads will migrate over to another host, but that honestly, until we do that, that is an assumption that we're making and we haven't actually validated that assumption. The next one might be uh, restarting the primary firewall. We're assuming that things are going to happen, but they may not actually play out that way in real life until we actually carry out the experiment. Similar with the next two, increasing CPU usage to actually validate that. And the last one is randomly restarting the service to actually validate that we're getting a notification. And so really what we're doing with chaos engineering is challenging our assumptions of what will happen. And similar to other forms of testing, that's what we're doing. We're assuming something about the resiliency of our system or how the system behaves in response to an event. Um, typically it's a, a, an undesired event, but it is an event nonetheless. And we need to know what will happen uh, if that is the case. Typically when we're talking about resiliency, we've planned in um, resiliency into the system, whether it's things like HA or uh, fault tolerance, constructs that we talk about when we talk about resiliency is that I expect my system to be able to handle some sort of failure. And kind of what Netflix thought as they were working through the chaos engineering was systems will fail. Um, it's not a matter of, of if they will fail, it's when they will fail. And so the thought was be prepared for when a system eventually fails because it's going to fail in some form or fashion. And so for those that aren't Netflix, what are the, why would I actually want to do this? This seems like an interesting thought experiment seems like something that a Netflix would do or a Facebook or a Google, um, the large organizations would do. So the, one of the first benefits is kind of, as we mentioned, validation of resilient configuration. And I specifically use the word configuration in this case, because especially with things like infrastructure as code, um, whether it's Terraform or ARM templates or CloudFormation, we're, we're now codifying the infrastructure aspect and in most cases, we're trying to leverage services or capabilities in public clouds that provide some form of resiliency. And the, the key aspect is understanding that we're, we're human beings and that there may be an intention 
of what we want the configuration to do that may not be the same as what the actual outcome is or may not line up with how the system is actually configured. And so leveraging chaos engineering actually helps us to validate that if I've configured a system for some form of resiliency, that that resiliency actually works as expected. Not so much if the service works, but if I have configured it correctly. The next one is validation of system monitoring. Um, similar to what I touched on about services is I've set up system monitoring to alarm on certain thresholds or on certain events. And the question becomes, how do I know that that actually works? And how do I know it actually works in the manner I anticipate it to? And especially when leveraging products, whether it's a new product or someone unfamiliar with product, even someone who's used a product for a number of years may not be number one, either fully aware of how a certain check should be performed or whether it may have been just misconfigured because it was, it was 12 o'clock at night and that's when you set it up. And so we need to validate that our system monitoring is actually working as anticipated as part of uh, an incident response strategy. And so the next one is understanding how systems behave during a failure. And so this one is, is less focused on actually ensuring that the system is resilient, but helping to, helping to train the organization to understand how things respond when there is a failure. So the first example is, what's the application response to a database outage? Hopefully there's a, a graceful response to where maybe the, the application doesn't fill up the logs for some reason because it, uh, it can't connect to the database or it can't write to the database. Um, but the question is, how do we know? How do we know how that application is going to behave if the database can't be reached? Similar to the next one, this is when we start to step into sort of the, the external aspects of an application and something like uh, an outage for Active Directory. So how, do we how does the application respond when it can't reach uh, Active Directory or some form of authentication? It's understanding what these behaviors look like because you, typically it's much easier to, to walk through it in a, a, a pre-canned uh, known environment. You know the event's going to happen as opposed to two or three o'clock in the morning and you're getting weird error messages and trying to figure out what's going on because the, the instance or the container can't reach Active Directory. And the next one is log information for outages. So similar to the last two, what, what's being thrown to the log? Maybe there's nothing actually showing up in the log that's actually relevant. But in this case, you've pre-canned or, or predefined what the outage is. And so if I decide, you know what, my application is not going to be able to reach its database. What shows up in the logs to give me an indication that it can't reach the database? Maybe what I'm expecting is maybe nothing shows up in the logs. Maybe I'm expecting system monitoring to handle that and notify me that maybe the database is down or somehow I'm testing the connection from the application to the database. Ultimately, it's one of those things of, we have a lot of assumptions about how the system will actually respond when there is an outage. And the next aspect is kind of touched on a bit, incident management. And so this helps refine that process of this critical service has an outage. How, how do all the processes we put in place how do those actually carry out in real life uh, when there is an actual event? Um, I'm sure most have actually experienced outages or some sort of incident, uh, but it's that part, part of that process to, to help refine that while there isn't an actual fire. And so similar to one of the, the concepts that's talked about with chaos engineering is firefighting. And so one of the things firefighters fighters do, as a lot of us I'm sure know, is actually simulate an actual fire to prepare them for when there is a real fire. So this is in a lot of ways what we're trying to do here with chaos engineering is essentially start a fire and figure out what the fire looks like, how we can put it out um, to help refine our ability to actually fight fires because there are going to be fires. We know there are gonna be fires. Um, I've never seen an environment where there are never any fires. And so we understand there are gonna be fires, so let's prepare for them. And so I talked about chaos engineering, and there's a bit of a science to it. And so one of the things becomes, how do I handle the, 
the actual process of chaos engineering. So one construct that is brought up with chaos engineering is what's known as steady state. And so what steady state is, what does a healthy environment look like? And so in this case, this is a, an example, uh, everyone's favorite WordPress application. It happens to be deployed on AWS. And so the steady state or my expectation of what a healthy environment looks like is that the WordPress website should be accessible. And so I go to the, the DNS, uh, go to the URL, and I can get to the WordPress site. Perfect, everything looks good. And so what steady state does, in most cases when we're talking about chaos engineering, is it's sort of that gate of preventing tests from running or experiments from running against an environment that we know is already in a degraded state or already in a bad state. There's no point in um, clobbering a bunch of EC2 instances and I know the database is broken already. There, that provides really no value because it's already broken. Um, the next aspect is the hypothesis. So this is really, we really start to step into the, the sort of scientific mindset or methodology. Um, similar to what we actually do with other forms of testing, oftentimes we just don't refer to it as hypothesis. And so this is making my assumption of, in this case, if an instance in the auto scaling group is unhealthy, the application will continue to respond. And so I'm anticipating that there's some sort of level of resiliency about the system that ensures that the application is going to respond, even if one of these instances is unhealthy. So the thought would be, um, the instance is gonna get killed off and recreate it and hopefully the next instance that comes up is healthy. So that's what we expect to sort of happen in the background on the AWS side. The next one is, if there is an availability zone outage, that the application will continue to respond. And so we anticipate or we assume that this is going to happen because the application is spread across multiple availability zones as it relates to the, the WordPress instance, as well as on the back end, the database. And so that's, that's our assumption. The, the thing is, we make assumptions, but if we never validate them, how do we know that that's actually the case? The next part would be the experiment. And so say we actually go and kill off a random EC2 instance in the auto scale group. What's, what's gonna happen? And as part of most uh, chaos engineering platforms uh, or frameworks or tools, what happens is after we've killed off the instance, we wait some period of time um, and then we eval evaluate if the WordPress site is still accessible. And so what this has done is give us the, the validation um, of whether our assumptions were correct. So hopefully the WordPress website is still accessible even after we've killed off the random EC2 instance. But if it's not, what that has done is disproved our assumption or our hypothesis about what's going to happen if the instance is killed off. And so there's tremendous value in this in understanding number one, that maybe there's a misconfiguration in what we've done as far as the auto scale group. Um, maybe there's something that's misconfigured on the back end. Maybe there's just something it can't reach at the moment, or maybe even there's something that new instances can't do that they should be able to do. And so this provides that value of if it is two, three o'clock in the morning, and for whatever reason, there is an unhealthy instance or multiple unhealthy instances, um, what is the behavior going to be? In this case, we've identified that at the moment, there potentially is an issue with how we've configured our resiliency. And so our system is not um, conformant to the level of resiliency that we anticipate it to be. And then the, the last aspect um, that's generally talked about with chaos engineering is rollback. And so as part of the experiment, um, sometimes there are rollback operations that need to be performed. In this case, there's no rollback because we're dealing with the auto scale groups and a new instance should be provisioned by itself automatically. Uh, but in the case of some experiments where maybe I'm moving a file that the application typically accesses, um, as part of a rollback procedure, I might decide to to rename the file back 
to what the application expects to get the application working again. And so it's part of the, the sort of the, the cleanup process of the chaos engineering. And so we step through what chaos engineering sort of looks like at a high level. And so what we'll actually do is we'll walk through two experiments to kind of solidify uh, what we would think of chaos engineering and the value that it can provide for us. So experiment number one, we've got an architecture of a auto scaling group that contains web servers um, placed behind a, a load balancer. So the thought is I want to provide a, a static website um, for my users to be able to access. In this case, uh, I feel like I've done the right thing. I've read the, the AWS, um, well, the architecture guides and the documents and I have a good, I feel like I have a good understanding of resiliency in AWS environment. And so I've stood up this and I've got, I use Terraform and I can figure it a max of two instances, desired size of one, and I want a minimum size of one. And so what I want to happen is in the event that the, the single instance is overwhelmed, let's say the, the CPU usage gets really high, um, I want another instance to be spun up. And so we'll check our steady state. And in this case, our steady state might be just hit the, the website and make sure it returns a 200 status. Um, maybe it's more complex, maybe it's less complex. Um, not sure how less complex you can get than that, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's ways people find. And so what we wanna do is our hypothesis is if the CPU usage gets too high, scale out the auto scaling group. That's what we want to happen. That's what we anticipate to happen. And so the way we test that is we use chaos engineering. Uh, there's a number of platforms and, and tools in the space that enable you to do things like spike CPU, spike memory um, on an instance. And so in this case, we're spiking the CPU usage on the, the single instance that's in the auto scale group right now. We, we wanna ramp it up to 95% and see what happens. And so we're gonna, after we've ramped it up, we're gonna wait a little bit and evaluate if the website is still accessible. And so maybe in this case, the website is not accessible. And what we've actually done is we thought we understood how auto scaling worked in AWS, but maybe we didn't understand that we needed um, metrics auto scaling. So we needed to define a threshold as it relates to our CPU usage for the instances. And so this is, would be an example of you use the right tools, you thought you understood what the configuration was supposed to be, but it didn't quite line up with how it actually worked in real life. And so this was validation of that the assumption that we made about what would happen was incorrect. And so it's, it's honestly not all that uncommon, um, especially those new to uh, public cloud or even just different cloud platforms. You maybe even have contextual knowledge of what another platform does and how it works and it doesn't really translate to another platform. And so it wasn't out of incompetence, it was just you didn't really understand um, all the intricacies of it. And so what, what we can do is actually validate that, oh great, I did configure it correctly, or no, I didn't really configure it correctly. Um, and what this does is sort of piggybacks on what we typically would do with acceptance testing. And so the extent of the acceptance testing might've been for this environment, it might have been just get that 200 um, status message from the, the website and okay, perfect. Everything is green, life is good. We've got the actual working website. And so this extends upon that to says, okay, yeah, the website works for now, but how does it respond during a failure or an outage? And so in the case of rollback for chaos engineering, it would be um, stop the experiment um, or some platforms refer to as an attack on the instance itself and bring down the, the CPU usage to normal levels. Um, there's additional things you could test here, whether it's uh, trying to validate the scale in behavior. Maybe once things return to normal, I want the, the group to scale in to a certain number of instances. And so what we're doing is continuing to validate these things that we assume are going to happen actually plays out in real life. 
And the other aspect, um, trying even getting more granular into like the auto scaling is how long does it take? Things like how long does it take to uh, bring that second instance online and bring down the, the overall CPU usage across the instances to an acceptable level? Things like that, where you can get really intricate in terms of some of the testing that's going on. Experiment number two, kind of further solidify, solidify this and move away from some of the traditional use cases. And so one example might be service B, uh, in this case, reads and writes information to an S3 bucket. Service A hits, talks to service B to actually get some information. And so service B might be reading from the S3 bucket, um, whatever the configuration might be. Uh, in this case, service A is talking to service B. Two services are talking together uh, to, to get some sort of transaction completed. Steady state in this case might be, I want service B to be accessible using the same request service A would use. And so in this case, mimic the, mimic the communication that um, service A would normally present to service B to validate that the service is actually running. And so another wrinkle might be ensuring that valid information is being pulled back or that a known error message is being returned. And so in this case, we want to um, validate that it's, it's healthy in the sense that it's responding in the manner we anticipate if there isn't a problem as well as if there is a problem. Similar with service A, maybe um, normal usage is a 200 response. And then maybe if there is an error or an issue with service B, maybe we get a 500 error or some sort of custom HTML page. Um, however, the, the, the actual application is architected or designed. And so we go through the hypothesis. Maybe we, we feel like we've designed this service to be pretty resilient. And so in the case of service B, in the event that it cannot write to the S3 bucket, maybe it's gonna write some of that information locally to sort of a, a transactional file that will ultimately get pushed to S3 when S3 becomes available. And then at that point, it's just it's simply gonna return the response of um, information it knows about. And so if it's ingested new information, it writes locally and is able to respond from its local uh, queuing of data. But if it doesn't have that data locally, it's gonna respond back to service A with an error message. Similar with service A, um, respond with an error page if it can't access service B for whatever reason. And so we carry out the experiment. We prevent the instance from, uh, in this case, service B's instance from accessing the S3 bucket. And so in this case, we've caused an outage or what would be an outage. And then we're going to evaluate if service A returns at the error page that we expect and if service B returns an error message um, of what would normally be responded to service A. And so this is sort of the departure from pure resiliency testing um, and more so understanding how the, the, the services respond and behave in the, in the event that there is an issue. And so what we're ultimately looking to do is gain number one understanding of how the service behaves, insight about um, how to actually address the issue if there is um, a problem and then what it also does is try to help us bring to light things like cascading failures. And so maybe um, in this case, if service B doesn't respond as anticipated to service A, maybe service A doesn't respond as anticipated to an external service that calls it. And then sort of on and on and on in a cascading manner to where if it actually happens in, in real life, in an unexpected or unplanned sort of event, we might, we might not be 100% certain that maybe it was the issue with service B that caused the cascading failure. And what we ultimately end up doing is sort of chasing our tails, running around trying to figure out what is actually down, what is actually causing the outage. And then similarly, rollback, we restore access to the S3 bucket. Um, and then the other aspect this sort of brings to light is once I restore that access, is there anything that needs to be done to service B or service A or any subsequent services to actually bring uh -huh. my, my application online? 
какие остались? And so when I first started delving into chaos engineering, it was always, yeah, this stuff looks really cool and looks interesting. And like I said, a, sort of a, more of a thought experiment as opposed to like something I could actually sort of unleash in my environment um, uh, for, for lack of a better phrasing. So the first thing I would say is identify an assumption. So we walked through a number of examples of things we assume about our environment, um, especially from a resiliency perspective, but also from just a functional behavior uh, in the event of a failure. And so typically these are the same things we think about when we walk through our architecture and think about single points of failure. We say, oh, maybe our web layer. Oh, there's no single point of failure there because we've got it in an auto scale group. Perfect, check. But then it's, well, is that really a check? Have we actually validated our assumption about that, um, that aspect of our resiliency. And so there's things we can walk through. So one being the application supports the failure of a single component. Um, those are the traditional single points of failure, trying to identify those. Um, the application supports the failure of a cloud region. Um, for those that happen to be uh, deploying applications across multiple regions for that, that, that really good resiliency, it's what does an actual regional failure look like? Um, and so in some of these cases, it may not be like, I'm going to somehow bring down AWS's US East one, um, because kind of the running joke is AWS does a good enough job of that already, so we can actually test the resiliency because of outages in US East one. Um, but maybe it's walking through that, that scenario by providing some sort of gating across regions or mimicking an outage at the uh, sort of local application level. Another one might be application, how does it gracefully handle, kind of as I mentioned, an accurate directory outage. Um, I assume that it handles it just fine. It, it throws a, a log message into the, the log and says, unable to connect to my AD server. That's what I'm assuming happens. Have I actually tested it? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and then the next one you start to step into um, less of like killing off instances and more so how does the application actually handle latency to the backend service? And so similar to the, the second experiment we walked through, uh, two services talking to one another, what happens if um, instead of an outage to that S3 service, uh, maybe it's a, a database and maybe the database is slow to respond. So service B is actually slow to respond to service A. Um, are things architected in such a way that service A can handle some sort of um, minimal latency between the two services, or maybe it doesn't just completely give up and um, just absolutely fall over. The question becomes, have we actually validated our assumption of, of what might happen? The next would be create an experiment. And so first thing I put is find a tool and start experimenting. I'm actually gonna cover a number of tools in the space um, in the next couple of slides, but find a tool that you think is interesting and tinker with it in your lab environment, in a, a test dev environment, and get in a feel for what you can and what you can't do. Um, kind of as the, the adage for most things, start small. Um, I'm assuming you're not gonna wanna try and mimic uh, an AWS region failure to test how your mission critical application uh, responds in the event of a failure. Maybe you do, maybe it is small for you, um, but I would assume probably not. So the next one is develop nice reporting output for consumption by others. I included this um, because especially when you start talking about chaos engineering, it's still, still relatively new to people. And so one of the big things is, um, depending on who you ask, even about just testing in general, is, well, that doesn't really provide value to the actual business or what I think of a, a functional perspective. It's just test. And so one way to help with that is develop information uh, that really can validate that says, okay, we all anticipate or we all assume that our application responds in this manner, but based upon the information that I have right here, the application doesn't respond very well in the event of failure. 
the next one would be as CI CD pipeline integration. Um, one thing is incorporate the chaos into lower level environment testing. And so I'm sure a lot of us are using things like Terraform, uh, infrastructure as code tools like Terraform, um, ARM templates, cloud formation, provision infrastructure at this point in time. Um, a lot of us have started to adopt things like whether it's inspect or inspec um, or some server spec stuff, um, more so inspect on terms of the, the cloud validation, uh, the cloud resources to actually validate that the infrastructure is is stood up as we expect it to be. And then the thing I would say is sort of attached. Um, in this case, uh, I used Chaos Toolkit as an example. It's a, a chaos engineering framework to actually validate the actual resiliency of the platform. Similar as we walked through with the, the EC2 instances and the auto scaling group is, yeah, I stood it up and I validate that Auto scale group is there, the load balance is there, everything looks good, the application is responding as I expect it to. And then now we hit it with the whammy and say, yeah, but how does it respond when we kill off EC2 instances or um, we muck with some of the configuration? How does it actually perform and respond to resiliency tests as well as allowing us to get better insights in terms of things like application logging, um, application response in the event of a failure? One of the next things that's talked about is scheduling chaos. So um, I would say focus on dev or test environments to avoid breaking production. Um, even though you'll see that one of the, the, the core things of chaos engineering is um, break stuff in production. It's the best way to find out. I do agree that it's the best way to find out, but uh, it's the best way to, to get heartburn. Um, so kind of along the lines of starting small, start in a, a, an environment that you're not overly concerned about breaking. Um, Next thing I would say is ensure that the steady state evaluation is accurate um, to accommodate for outages as well as maintenance windows if you're scheduling chaos. chaos um, probably wouldn't want to, to be killing off stuff during the middle of a maintenance window while you're working on something else. Um, that could cause undesirable results. Um, and the next thing is if it started to roll out to other aspects of the organization, um, agree upon a window in which chaos can be performed. Um, similar to the maintenance window, um, but also the aspect of uh, a lot of organizations have freeze, uh, change freezes, um, things like that, where they expect the environment to be up, um, at least to the extent that nobody is intentionally breaking the environment. Next one, as I kind of mentioned, chaos engineering tools. So uh, we walked through chaos engineering. It's interesting. I feel like there could be a use case for it. And like, how do I get started? So here's some, some chaos engineering tools. Um, actually on the CNCF landscape is a section that talks about chaos engineering. Um, so there's a number of tools on there that can actually be leveraged for um, chaos engineering of some form, whether it's specific for Kubernetes or just in chaos engineering in general. A couple of those items. One is chaos monkey, um, kind of as I mentioned at the start, created by Netflix, um, leveraged by them, randomly terminates EC2 instances. Um, and I think it actually does a little bit more as I actually saw that Simeon Army has actually been uh, archived, sort of deprecated. And so I think there's additional folks that's been added there. Um, it is open source. Gremlin is a, a big player in the space. It's a SaaS solution, um, integrates with AWS, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, remote machines, et cetera. Um, it being SaaS, they have an online dashboard that you can access and um, integrate with the environment and run attacks is what they call them against the environment um, and basically walk through that process of killing stuff off, manipulating the environment to figure out how it handles. Next one I mentioned previously, Chaos Toolkit. Excuse me. It's a really interesting one. Open source, um, works with AWS, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, Istio, Cloud Foundry, there's a number of other ones. It's actually a Python 3 application um, that you can install and create experiments in JSON that define uh, things like the steady state, the hypothesis, actually walk through uh, killing off instances or uh, mimicking latency or manipulating latency in an Istio environment. Um, never really interesting things that can be done with that, as well as integrate it um, into other Python applications uh, if you want to extend it 
to add additional functionality or incorporate it with like a pipeline or something like that. Another one is Litmus Chaos. Uh, open source, this one is uh, strictly Kubernetes. So for doing things like killing off pods and uh, manipulating the Kubernetes environment, deploy it via a Helm chart. And got, interestingly enough, I actually stumbled upon this one a couple of months ago. It's, it's actually by VMware, which I was kind of surprised. So VMware Mangle, um, open source, does work with Kubernetes, Docker, um, works with VMware vSphere, remote machines, as well as AWS. It can be downloaded as an OVA or uh, integrated into a Kubernetes environment. All right, well, that is the end of my talk. I definitely uh, appreciate the, the time and available for any questions. Hey, Martez, uh, what was something that you thought you knew about your system that you didn't after you found out with uh, this approach? Yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest thing was along the lines of kind of as I talked about more so like the application perspective, like I think we all have sort of these, as we're building applications and integrating things, we all have sort of a, a thought process in the back of our minds about how the, uh, the actual application is going to respond when there is a failure. Um, and so biggest thing I, I, I definitely picked up was for me, a, a new perspective of as designing applications of anticipating more so those uh, additional issues that are caused by uh, whether it's services being able to unconnect, unable to connect so things more so from like the troubleshooting side of digging into the logs and like not having actual helpful information. It's like, oh, hey, maybe not to say you code for everything, but you have those general buckets of things that you're actually providing useful information in the logs. So how would you extend um, these tools to asynchronous environments, for instance, uh, message queues or um, SQS, things like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on what you're trying to test. Um, if you're, you're testing sort of the, the, the pub sub mechanism for the application, um, whether it's something like um, maybe it's injecting bad data into the message queue, um, maybe it's doing something like um, trying to uh, flood the consuming side with a ton of messages that you would normally not generate. Um, so that way, whether it's like, let's say on the consuming side, you have an auto scale group set up um, and you expect it to scale when there's a certain number of messages in the queue. And maybe you just flood the queue with thousands and thousands of messages and you see how it responds to that increased flood of messages and understand um, potentially how both the, the, the producing side handles that in terms of response. Maybe you've got some checks in there to do some throttling or some windowing. Um, and then also on the consuming side, maybe it, it's supposed to scale out in an anticipated time, and maybe it just never reaches that. Um, I have a quick question. And yep. if, it, if it goes into um, like a, if it gets too deep, just let me know. Um, and the short version is basically, um, if you're doing a lot of telemetry data collection, um, do you know of any ways or standard practices to be able to, to basically not dirty up your standard operating statistics with your chaos engineering uh, behaviors? Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it definitely does. Um, and so it all depends on oftentimes how the application is written. And so you may be in essence with the chaos, be able to sort of initiate a flag um, on the application side that is like dev logs or, or dev event. And so that way, um, maybe the application writes to a separate log or um, maybe you, you could even potentially manipulate it during the actual chaos experiment um, to almost like reconfigure the application on the fly, quote unquote to say, um, 
manipulate the log output or the, the telemetry um, as a way to avoid dirtying it up, dirtying up um, your, your production te telemetry, um, or even just for the aspect of seeing, hey, this is, this is from when we ran chaos experiment 15 or chaos experiment 18. Um, and so it'd be, oftentimes I imagine it's gonna be potentially using the automation mechanisms available in some of the, the, the chaos engineering tools as part of the experiment. So maybe the first sort of stage or step in the experiment is um, reach out to the application and sort of tweak it or manipulate how it logs and then um, go through the experiment. And then kind of as we talked about with the rollback, then basically roll back that setting to what it normally should be. Okay, thank you. Like I was thinking, a uh, uh, Sean, a, a low tech way of that might just be like an annotation in your um, graphing software, the same where you might annotate, hey, that was an outage or a uh, maintenance event, which is why the the graphs look all weird here. Yeah, and I was thinking that like something to the effect along the same lines, saying uh, in a sense, in the same way you would do a scheduled downtime, you'd have a scheduled event okay yeah i mean you can also do it i guess on the per environment basis right so if you're practicing your chaos engineering and uh your sandbox or lab environment then you could either just just well, not necessarily discard that data but certainly put the retention limits on uh the, the metrics and the log rates from that on a much shorter time frame than you have for like production where you might want a month or two weeks of data or something like that makes sense it's an interesting question too because we uh, are helping out a client pick up Datadog, and one of the things that you have to watch, um, and I'm not bad mouthing Datadog in any way. So, um, but one of the things that you have to watch is how much data are you sending to Datadog on, on a daily basis? Because if something goes wrong, then you're you know you're spewing terabytes and terabytes of, of log data um, that's not even useful in, in, in getting billed for that. So. Hey, Mark, does something else you uh, said that uh, spoke to me was this idea of checking that after you induce chaos that the system actually comes back the way you thought it would. I think in your example, it was we increased the CPU by usage and we checked the auto scaling, but then when things go back to normal, does it actually go back down? And so when you're doing those sorts of tests, like, do you just have like, like sleep statements in there? Like, like, are you just saying like, wait 15 minutes and like, like check it out again? Or how do you uh, approach that, that type of testing? Yeah, so um, a number of the tools actually have um, mechanisms like pauses. And so one of the things, one of the ones I'm most familiar with is a uh, chaos toolkit. And so what you actually do is like, it's like a pause statement. So in the case of like, let's say um, I'm testing an auto scale group scale out event, I'm going to kill off an instance. And in most cases, I know that my instance isn't going to come back up in like 20 seconds. So I'm going to wait like, let's say three minutes or five minutes for the instance to come back up into a healthy state. Um, and then I'm going to run the test. And then so similar to the, the scale in event is adding in a pause um, an anticipated time. And so what that also does is helps you um, validate timing of like, we anticipate this only takes five minutes to, to come back up healthy. And maybe it actually takes 15, 20 minutes. But like until that event actually happens, we don't really know how long it takes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as well as giving you uh, better like SLAs on how long things take. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely definitely a, a mechanism that can help with SLAs and SLOs. Um, and the other thing, kind of to that point, was um, in the case of whether it's certain applications where maybe there is an outage, maybe I do need to do something like maybe I need to restart a service or um, kick the database, whatever it might be, after it comes back up. And maybe if I've never actually experienced that event, I don't know it that that actually is in real time. And so I'm wasting maybe an hour or two hours trying to figure out like 
what should we do? And maybe the, maybe the DBA doesn't get in until like another three hours. What are um, uh, some ways you might justify uh, putting this effort into to management of like why it's worth like spending engineering time on this? Yeah, I mean, I would say kind of as I talked about in the, the reporting aspect, um, it's, I think you can start small, get some, some interesting wins. Um, and especially as, especially with moving to the cloud, I mean, there are things that we're, 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 we're preaching to the management and some of the executives talking about, yes, we're moving to the cloud, it's more resilient, it's got all these great services, um, AWS is never going to have an outage, um, and it's some of those things of like, we're making all these assumptions and almost all these promises about the resiliency of our application, and it's, can we actually verify that? And the other thing would be not to, not to, not to so much point at others, but uh, understand what's happening in the IT landscape where you could say, oh, hey, last week, this company had an outage um, that lasted for X number of hours. Uh, maybe we don't want to experience that same sort of thing. Um, let's, let's go through this process or this experiment um, and see actually how things respond. That everything in the cloud is uh, instant. Yeah, it, it, it's instant and, and works perfectly every single time. Um, All the time. You know, uh, another, interesting, another, inter interesting, another interesting thing, thing to think about, I can't talk today, is uh, potential for data loss and like cluster databases as well, right? So um, data integrity of your database is after the fact. So I don't know, let's say you've got a three node Mongo cluster. And yeah. Yeah, and I think that was actually um, one of the things that precipitated um, Netflix to start looking into chaos engineering. I think there was a database corruption event mm -hmm. that they apparently didn't want to have again. Yeah, so they, well, they so, you know, it's all the Jepson tests. I don't know if you've read the Jepson tests or not, but those are, those are always fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of interesting things to, to validate as far as assumptions. And I, I know definitely when, when architecting systems, it's always like, you're looking for those. You're looking for those single points of failure, and like when you when you feel like you've checked them off, it's like, oh, perfect. There's no more single point of failure. Like, I've added an HA, and, and it's like, how often do we actually test that? Yeah, then your HA goes down, right? <laughs> or or actually causes the outage. Yeah, uh, that's not fun. Hey, have you mentioned the Chaos Toolkit? Yep. Can you use that to stress individual systems? You guys are talking a lot about cloud infrastructure, but can you use chaos tools to to stress like push memory or or push network bandwidth down or that sort of thing too? Yep. So um, I know Gremlin supports CPU memory. I think they also do some things with disk. Um, I know VMware Mangle can do CPU as well as memory. Um, I think it also does like on the vSphere side, like disconnect to NIC. Um, Chaos Toolkit has some some capabilities around like network latency things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean there's there's definitely a a growing desire and a, a growing um, feature set in the the sort of the chaos engineering uh, ecosystem of being able to test those individual systems. Thanks. Right on. Uh, like any other questions from Martez? I think there might be some in the chat. I can't see the chat right now. I just see a number. <laughs> I think uh, folks folks just said now. So. Okay. Yeah, there are mostly congratulatory messages. Which, by the way, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. It was definitely interesting as I started digging through um, chaos engineering, like I said, it was always 